Given continuation to the work, we open the section with our next speaker, Dr. Gary Schwartz. Dr. Schwartz is a professor of philosophy, psychology, excuse me, medicine, neurology, psychiatry, and surgery at the University of Arizona, and director of its Human Energy Systems Laboratory. After receiving his doctorate from Harvard University, he served as a professor of psychology and psychiatry at Yale University, director of the Yale Psychophysiology Center, and director of the Yale Behavioral Medicine Clinic. He has published more than 400 scientific papers, edited 11 academic books, and is the co-author with Professor Linda Rosek of the Living Energy Universe, an author, author of the Afterlife Experiment, Breakthrough Sci Scientific Evidence of the Life After Death. His presentation today is about the sci science and spirit of energy healing, applications to personal health and global peace. Please help welcome or dear friend, Gary Schwartz. Hello, everyone. What a privilege to be here today and to uh, be in the presence of such um, inspired speakers and um, inspired goals for all of us in this audience. I was uh, invited uh, to speak to you about the topic of the relationship between science and also the spirit of energy healing with applications to both our own personal health and peace, both personal and global. The, um, there are two images on this slide, which I use partly as a reminder for me and also to highlight for you. The first is an image on the left. It's actually a piece of artwork. It's a deer shaman. It's made by a man called Bill Worrell. And it's titled, I Reach for Forces Unseen. And this poem represents uh, so much the, uh, that he wrote for this sculpture, so much represents the essence of things that we're going to be talking about in this period of time that I, that I really like to share it and honor it. You'll also, by the way, see, um, it's kind of amusing because at the, you'll notice that you can't see this, but there's actually, he's holding a raven. And uh, we're going to come back to a raven at the end. And when I was being picked up today at the, uh, at the hotel to come here by Vanessa, and thank you so much for inviting me, I noticed that there's a cab waiting in line to come into the Hilton, and it was raven cabs. <laughs> so I feel right at home. The other is an image of a, a representation of energy healing, but you'll notice I selected this particular image because you'll notice that you see all this light behind them. The implication being that there's more to healing than just comes from the, quote, healer, which of course is fundamental to the principle of spiritism. And I'm, although I will not be talking about research on that here, I will end with the implications of that because that's really the frontier for where science and spirituality come together. Now, there, is, there are three related books that I've had the privilege to write, all of which are integrated implicitly, if not explicitly, into this work. We're going to be talking about the energy healing experiments, but there's work on life after death, which is the energy, afterlife experiments, and also the notion of a higher and infinite intelligence, which stands for the GOD guiding, organizing, designing process. And all we, although I won't have time to talk about any of that here, I wish to honor the presence of that. The, uh, when I first finished uh, the rough draft of this book, it was read by a physician um, and friend, Dr. James Levin. And he said something to me on the telephone which was so deep that I wrote it down and then asked him if I could actually quote him. And I use this as the quote to the preface of the book. And it reads, may the story captivate us, the science awaken us, and the truth transform us. How's that for a spontaneous quote? Not bad. May the story captivate us, the science awaken us, and the truth transform us. So here's what I'm going to do, since we're a diverse audience. 
I'm going to begin briefly with some stories about energy healing so you have some sense of what happens in energy healing. Then we're going to move on to science. A little bit about theory, a little bit about ex experiments we could all perform, and then actual laboratory experiments. Then we're going to look at the implications of these facts, this knowledge, for our person personal health, the health of our loved ones, the health of the healthcare system, and the planet as a whole, and we're going to do all of this in now 40 minutes. So put your seatbelt on, and here we go. Let's start with energy healing stories. How many of you have actually experienced energy healing? That is, you've been on a table and somebody's worked on you. Could you raise your hands? Okay, maybe half of the audience or more. That's really quite remarkable, by the way. But since some of you haven't, let me briefly share with you an example of how it was that I, as a scientist, a Western-trained scientist, was moved to start entertaining this work. It was the mid-1990s, I was in, um, on the East Coast visiting a psychotherapist who in the book I call Suzanne. And she was learning something called healing touch. Have any of you heard of healing touch? Raise your hands, okay. I had never at that time. She received a phone call, Suzanne did, from one of her patients, a female attorney whose husband had just fallen off the roof. And he may have broken his back, may have broken his wrist, was in severe pain, was in the emergency department, and uh, Suzanne was asked if she would come to help. Suzanne said yes. I was invited because I was trained in clinical psychology, so I went along. And there is this gentleman, you'll have to imagine him, lying down in a bed in a room by himself in severe pain. He had had no medication, had not yet been x-rayed. Suzanne says to me, she says, Gary, she said, would you take his wife outside and, and talk with her? I'm going to try to do some energy work with him. I didn't know what she was talking about. <laughs> but I nonetheless invited the wife out and, uh, and started speaking with her and asking her her name and what had happened and so on. But what I did was I positioned her in such a way that I could look over her shoulder <laughs> to see what Suzanne was doing. So you have to again imagine this gentleman. And the first thing that I noticed Suzanne doing was taking her hands and sort of wiping the air over his body. She was not touching him. I later learned that she was doing something called body scanning, according to Healy Touch. She was sensing the energy. Then she went down to his wrist and started going like this. She was wiping the air around his wrist. I later learned this was called energy unruffling. It's what they call it, a particular form of uh, energy clearing. Then she took her finger and started going like this, like drilling an imaginary hole in his hand. When I saw this, I thought this. <laughs> I later learned this is called a laser technique, and it's a particular technique that, are, that healing touch practitioners are taught in order to reduce pain. Well, we were invited back into the room after about 15 minutes, and there was this man smiling like a Cheshire cat, claiming that his pain was virtually gone. Now, he was not about to play tennis. Turns out he had severely injured his back and had broken his wrist. But at this moment, his pain was gone, and the question was, what happened to his pain? Did it just spontaneously disappear? Was it some sort of placebo effect? Somehow his mind, because he was impressed and believed in Suzanne, his mind affected his body. Or was it something to do with Suzanne's intention and, quote, her energy, or the energy that she was receiving? Was that how somehow related to why this man experienced relief? I.e., is energy healing, quote, real, and does it involve energy? As a scientist, that's the journey that I went on in this particular work. Now, if we're going to talk about energy, we should briefly mention Einstein, and we should talk about what we mean, because there's a revolution taking place in physics, of many of whom, in terms of conventional science, or the public have yet to fully realize it. This is what Einstein said. Let me read this to you. He said, we may therefore regard matter as being constituted by the regions of space in which the energy field is extremely intense. There is no place in this new kind of physics, both for the field and matter, 
for the field is the only reality. I quote, there's no place in this new kind of physics both for the field and matter, for the field is the only reality. Now, what does he mean by this? Well, I don't know about you, but I feel this desk or feel a chair. It feels real, right? You feel your bodies. It feels real. Well, what Einstein was trying to teach us and what the history of science should have taught us is, be is just because something looks a certain way to our limited senses does it mean that's the way it really is. For example, we look out over the earth, whether it's in Baltimore or Connecticut or Tucson or Japan or China or Brazil, we look out over the earth when we're on the earth and it looks flat. It looks flat to us. And yet, what did science ultimately teach us? The earth is actually a sphere. It's round. And learning that has helped us to understand and work with the earth. Or, another common experience that our limited senses tell us is that um, if you have a clear day, it is obvious that this blob of light seems to appear over the horizon or over the mountains in the case of Tucson, pops up. And over the course of the day, it's at different positions of the sky and then it disappears on the other side. And what does it look like to us? The sun is revolving around the earth. It's obvious. That's what the senses say. But is that the way it really is? No. In fact, we actually learned it was backwards. The sun doesn't revolve around us. We revolve around it as the earth revolves around itself. Well, it's obvious to our naked senses. The object is solid. The earth is flat. The sun revolves around the earth. But quantum physics tells us that what we call solid objects are mostly empty space. Anybody know how empty it is? 99.9999999. Here's how to envision this. Imagine that we have an atom of hydrogen and you imagine it to be the size of the Empire State Building. And the question we want to ask is how big is the nucleus? Is it 10 stories high? That's where most of the mass is in the nucleus. One story high? One foot high? Quantum physics tells us it's about approximately the size of a grain of sand. So what we're seeing is that we have to go beyond our everyday limited senses if we're going to understand the true and greater reality. Einstein knew that. Quantum physicists are seeing that. And this is where spiritism in particular and contemporary science are coming together because they're leading to a, a vision that's greater than what we normally experience. The research that I describe in the uh, Energy Healing Experiments book, much of it was supported by NIH, National Institutes of Health, as part of a center which I and one other principal investigator, actually from the University of Connecticut, received called Center for Frontier Medicine and Biofield Science. By the way, the term frontier did not mean cowboy as in going to the Arizona. It actually meant at the frontier of knowledge. And biofield was the term that, that um, the uh, NIH used. I include this slide not only to honor my colleagues, but to point out to you their disciplines. Notice there's biostatistics, physiology, psychiatry, neuroscience, psychology, cardiology, nursing, optical sciences, music, surgery, medical anthropology, biophysics. Why so many different disciplines? Well, if everything's energy, if the field is the only reality, then no one discipline owns energy because it applies to everything. If it applies to everything, it means ultimately every aspect of the healthcare system is going to ultimately need to conceive of and work with the energetic basis of everything. I've had the privilege to work with many different healing traditions and more are emerging. Some of you may recognize, some of you may not. How many of you have heard of Reiki? Okay, many of you. How about Joe Ray? Wow, I'm impressed. Um, Joe Ray is a, also a Japanese healing tradition, deeply spiritual in its basis. Qigong, have you heard of Qigong? Excellent. Healing touch, we've already said. What about reconnective healing? Wow, okay, it's a form of energy healing that 
that in spiritual healing that comes actually originally out of California. Yoga, of course, you've all heard about. Native American healing, you've heard about. How about vortex healing? Wow. And then, of course, sound healing. Whether these techniques are very old or very young, they share certain things in common, and one of them is the idea of energy. If we had time, I would take you through the experience of actually sensing your energy and trying your energy. We don't have time for that today, unless you really want to, do you? Yeah? yeah? All right. <laughs> we'll, we'll skimp on some of the data stuff. There's no better way of knowing about energy than experiencing it yourself. So here's what I'd like you to do. Put your pads down and so on, get comfortable. Take your non-dominant hand, that's the hand that you don't write with, and sort of just relax your fingers and, and bend them like so, okay? Then take the, your index finger of your dominant hand, place it about a half inch from your palm. Don't touch your palm. And then what I want you to do is to rotate, make a circle clockwise around your palm like so, going around about once a second. And as you're making this circle, I want you to pay attention to any sensations that you may have in the palm of your hand or in your index finger or in the relationship between the two. You can try speeding it up if you want or slowing it down. You can try reversing the direction and going backwards. Anybody experience anything? Raise your hands. Wow. You're a weird audience. Okay. <laughs> Um, <laughs> the, uh, in, a, in a quote normal audience, you know, like undergraduate students or, uh, or just the lay public, about 50 to 60 people, 60% 60 of the audience will raise their hands. Among a group of healers, energy healers, 100% will raise their hands. You were 90 plus percent. What were people experiencing, anyone? Tingling. tingling. How many of you are experiencing tingling? Raise your hands. Excellent. What else? Heat. heat. How many of you experience heat? Raise your hands. Excellent. What else? O openness? Like space. You were feeling like you were moving in space? Wow, that's unusual. How many of you experience space inside your hand? That's a rare response. A few of you? Anybody feeling any pressure? A few of you? Anybody feeling anything moving? That when you were moving your hand, there was something running? Okay. Now, if a Western trained physician or scientist sees a group of people in a hospital, moving their hands around, and then talking about these experiencing, what's he going to think? Right. Because there are three possible explanations for this. The first, which would be the conventional explanation, is what I've already said. You're a strange group of people. <laughs> You've come to this meeting for this particular celebration. You see somebody who's professionally dressed, who has degrees after his name, who's instructing you to pay attention to your hands and feel something. And what you're doing is you're imagining it. It's all in your head. That is one hypothesis. Second hypothesis is what did I do? I asked you to pay attention to your hands. And the reason why you feel heat is because there's heat in the hand. The reason why you feel tingling is because you have tingling sensations in your hand. The reason why you feel pressure or movement is because you're moving your hand in this pressure. The empty space is a little bit more unusual. <laughs> and that's the root of the sensations. But there's a third possibility. Your finger is actually generating an electromagnetic field and other fields as well, even more so when you move it. Your hand is serving as an antenna and receiver for this signal. And some of you, in fact, many of you, are sensitive enough, are open enough to actually be receiving this information. And the question is, which is it? I'm going to jump right to the question of reviewing for us what do we mean by an antenna to show you, in fact, that we are, at a, even at an electrophysiological point of view, actually generators and receivers of signals. These are different kinds of antennas. How many of you have seen the antenna on the upper left? How many of you have actually had one? Okay. A rabbit ears antenna, right? Used for television, old television. The one on the right, that's what's called the Yagi antenna. It was, this particular one was actually designed for FM reception. 
there's a little dial, uh, motor on top where you can actually turn it to point in a particular direction. I was a professor at Yale for 12 years, and we had on top of our colonial home a 40-foot antenna with double Yagi, two Yagi's antennas. No, it was not pretty. <laughs> but we could turn that dial, point it toward Manhattan, and pick up WQXR radio, classical music. Now, of course, this is in the mid-1980s. Now we have satellite dishes that do all of this in spades. These are, of course, various kinds of satellite dishes. Anybody recognize the antenna on the left? Most people don't. That's the, actually the indoor antenna for XM radio. If you have XM radio and you use it on the indoors, it's a tiny little one and the one on the right. Now, why am I showing you? Last quick story before we move on to actual experiments. I was five or six years old. My parents had gotten their first television. You can infer from the color of my beard and the amount of hair on my head that was quite a while ago. <laughs> it was a black and white television. Came in a big wooden piece of furniture. Any of you ever have such a TV? Okay. And it had rabbit ears, which you had to adjust to pick up the TV. We had a lot of stations in those days, like three or four. <laughs> and what did you have to do if you wanted to change the station? Get up, walk to the TV and turn the knob. What happened to the picture? It got blurry, yeah, okay. I couldn't understand this. I'm a little kid. I feel sorry for my parents, by the way. So I started playing with this antenna. And I noticed that there's a wire attached to it. And it's screwed into the back of the TV. So I went to my father's toolbox, pulled out a screwdriver, unscrewed the wire. And what happened to the picture? Went away. I then took my finger and touched <laughs> the screw. And then sort of you know, climbed around with my finger and looked to, to see what the picture was doing. What do you think I saw? I saw a picture. I let go. What happened? Went away. I touched it again. What happened? Reappeared. What was the implication? I was a rabbit ears. <laughs> For what? By the way, I, I share this kind of a lecture at, um, um, at Canyon Ranch, which is a health resort, which is also very actively involved in this work, very committed to both energe energy and spirituality. And a, a guest who heard me give this lecture about two months ago, he was so excited by this because he had saved his old rabbit ears antenna. He actually gave it to me as a gift, mailed it to me, and he had made it into a little hat that I could wear. <laughs> I don't wear it, but I deeply appreciate it. Well, how do we know if this is real? I mean, is this just, you know, you want to quote replicate. Scientists are concerned with replication. Of course, I didn't know that at the time. I just wanted to know. My parents had an AM radio, one of those old AM radios, big wooden box, you know, a big dial with a wire hid behind the couch. I unscrewed the wire. What happened to the music? Went away. I touched the back of the radio. What happened? Reappeared. Everybody put up your index finger, please. Believe it or not, right now, each of us in this room are picking up hundreds and hundreds of television programs. <laughs> we are picking up hundreds and hundreds of digital quality radio stations as well as AM and FM from the broader area. We are picking up tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of cell phone calls. We are picking up GPS signals and God knows what else. And we have virtually no conscious awareness of this. If anything in contemporary science awakens us to the power and the brilliance and the interconnectedness of the invisible, it is what we were learning in simply radio and television and now all of this other communication stuff. But more importantly is the fact that each of us are generating magnetic signals from our own temple, our own, little, our own bodies. Our hearts, for example, generate an electromagnetic signal called the EKG, a magnetic signal called the MEG or magneto, um, MCG magneocardiogram. That signal is strong enough with a contemporary magnetic detectors for if there was a camera in the corner of the room, it would pick up my heartbeat. 
what the implication is is that literally each of us in this room right now, we are bathed in each other's heart signals. We are literally serving as antennas and receivers for each other's energy. You can document this in the laboratory. And once you have the realization that not only everything is energy, but we're all interconnected by energy, the notion that we're not just single islands and that we're having effects on each other leads us to reevaluate some of the, the deepest spiritual traditions and wisdoms across the major religions in new light. So let's talk a little bit about actually contemporary science. And I'll just go through this very quickly, just to give you a feeling for it. Each one is fun and we could talk about it in depth, but I want to give you just a little bit of a flavor so we can also talk about the implications for our own health and ultimately as we heard, peace for peace. This says, measuring energy effects with sensitive ELF magnetic field detectors. Forget all the words on the bottom. Healers of all different traditions, and I've now been trained in five different energy healing, energy and spiritual healing traditions. We're essentially taught as follows. That what we do is we invite energy in. We serve as an antenna or a channel or a receiver or a medium for energy. We then allow this to go through our bodies and for the best and highest good, we typically pass it out our hands or our hearts in the service of our cl clients, patients, um, people that we're providing l love and healing for, be it local or distal. And we are taught that we can turn it on or turn it off. We have some control over its emission. And the question is, are we really controlling anything? Are we really emitting anything? Remember, I'm a scientist. I'm asking these basic questions. And ELF stands for extra low frequency. These are signals in the biological realm, like 10 cycles per second, which are like related to alpha waves in the brain, or four to eight cycles per second, which are theta waves, or one to four, which are delta waves, or slower. There's a device called a SQUID, superconductive quantum interference device, that measures very t tiny magnetic fields. And uh, it's very expensive super cooled, minus 100 degrees or more centigrade. And if a healer, it's been done very rarely because this equipment is so expensive, if a healer puts their hand in front of the device and you just measure the background signal, which is that upper curve, what you see is tiny ripples. But if the healer is then instructed to receive and run the energy, you'll notice there's an increase in the oscillation. You see that? That's operating initially about 10 cycles per second, going down to eight to five cycles per second, and then down to one cycle per second. Well, I began to wonder what would happen if we could, if everybody could do this, everybody could at least measure it. And there are new digital ELF magnetic field detectors. They only cost a few hundred dollars, not hundreds of thousands of dollars. They are portable. They're designed to be, to measure all magnetic fields in physical environments. They go down to 0.1 milligauss. I and Melinda Connor and Mary Flores and some of my other colleagues, we began to wonder, could we use these little devices to, Change, to measure the change in magnetic fields coming off our hands. Because if we could find a quiet enough environment to measure them in, and if we could actually do it, then healers could get biofeedback, an energy biofeedback, for whether they're actually doing something. So we embarked on research, which I'm going to show you momentarily. By the way, when I, went to, when I first gave these results at the Science and Consciousness meetings in Santa Fe last year, someone came up to me afterward and they said, uh, Dr. Schwartz, we know you do controversial research. Because I do, I mean, I do research with mediums on life after death. And they said, but is it true that you're now studying elves? <laughs> I said, no, it's actually ELF, it stands for extra low frequency. For the record, I have no objection to elves, I have no opinions about elves. Um, but that was not the purpose. Okay, here's an example of an experiment. We had seven practitioners of Reiki. Skilled Reiki practitioners, they were brought into the laboratory individually. And in each case, we studied separately their ability to run energy with their left hands and their right hand. So the graphs on the left are the left hand, the graphs on the right are the right hand. In each case, we did two trials. The blue trial is the, is the line is the first trial, the red tri line is the second trial. I wanted to see if they could replicate with each hand and do it twice. In each case, we had two conditions. 
We had a baseline condition where they sat quietly with their eyes closed. We measured the background activity. And then we had them, quote, running energy. And the question is, what happened? Well, if you look, you can see that in the, both the left hand and the right hand, when you look at the baseline conditions, it's about 30 to 35 units of oscillations in the meter per minute, okay, which is a quantification of the magnetic field fluctuation. But when they were actually running energy, you see it increased. It increased to 40 or 45 per so. When you do the, the what's called repeated measures analysis of variance, a statistic, don't worry about the details, the p-value, probability of this occurring by chance, is p less than 0.000001. One in a million of this happening by chance. Highly reliable. When healers run energy Reiki practitioners, there's a change in the magnetic fields from the hands. I didn't believe it. I had to see it replicated. So we did another experiment. We looked at master healers. I call them master healers. These people were flying in from all over the country. They were trained with people like Rosalind Bier and Barbara Breda. They included Eric Pearl, the founder of Reconnective Healing. These people have been doing healing for 20 to 30 years or more. They had tens of thousands of patient hours of experience. We had them do the same thing, left hand, right hand, two trials, baseline. And you can see the basic effect is there, except the magnitude of the effect is greater particularly in the right hand. P-value again, P less than 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. Experienced healers tell us that the left side of the body is more of the, quote, receiving side, and the right side of the body is more of the sending side, which is consistent with their data. If you put all of this on one curve, so you have 17 practitioners on the left, Reiki practitioners, the 15 master healers on the right, you average the two trials, so now the blue line is the left hand and the red line is the right hand. We see both of them show the effect. The effect is larger in the master healers, particularly in the right hand. We've done this experiment now multiple times. One of the most recent ones, which is really interesting, is what happens if someone has no formal training in healing? They've never tried healing before. They don't have any prior training in Reiki or Healy Touch or anything else, and they want to learn healing. Can they do this just because they want to? Or does training help? And as uh, thanks to uh, the, uh, the Reconnective Healing uh, uh, program, because they're very interested in research, we were actually able to, to do an experiment on this where we, we tested people who had had for no formal training in healing before and after having received uh, Reconnective Healing, two and a half days of intensive training. And what we observed was that prior to training, the curves were flat even though they intended to produce the effects, they couldn't. But after two and a half days of intensive education in healing and receiving of guidance, the effects occurred. It looks like it's a healing effect. Well, of course, if there are physiological, particularly magnetic, for example, and that's, I'm just giving you a like, tidbit of possibilities here. And what's interesting about magnetic fields is that magnetic fields affect everything. There's a whole field of what's called bioelectromagnetics. In the journals and so uh, the journal and so on, hundreds if not thousands of articles on the effects of low-level bioelectromagnetic fields on human cells, animal cells, plant cells, single cells, organisms, the properties of water, where 80 to 90 percent water. So theoretically, healers should be able to work with animals. How are you aware that there are actually now healers who specialize in the treatment of animals? Have any of you ever had a pet that was treated with, a, with an energy or spiritual healer? Did any of your pets respond positively? Very often, animals will show very powerful effects to this. Now, one of the great things we did, the research I'm about to tell you with, was done with rats. One of the great things about rats is they don't know Reiki from Schmeiki. <laughs> they haven't been taught to believe or disbelieve. So they have a purity of openness. However, the average rat can tell whether somebody's standing in front of their cage, moving their hands up and down. So if you're going to do research on the effects of energy healing on an animal, you have to control for the presence of a healer. And therefore, you need to take sham practitioners who have no training in healing, no intention to heal, but mimic what the healer is doing. So that if you have a videotape, which we did, of real healers and the uh, sham healers doing this, and you looked at a videotape, you couldn't tell which was which, which is exactly what happened. Now, rats... Um, Ann Baldwin is a professor of physiology, and she, one of her areas of expertise and was, is in measuring what's called microvascular leakage and inflammation in the guts of rats. 
Rats are very sensitive and can very easily be stressed, for example, by noise. And they develop this, um, this clones-like um, response. And if um, one of the things that's very tragic about our spirituality and the way we treat animals is that we don't typically think about or care about the kinds of conditions that our animals are raised in, including research animals, and for example, the uncontrolled noises that may be affecting them. And Anne found that, that, that noises would actually produce actual damage in the guts of rats. This is a slide that's taken of the, of, of, from the gut of an animal that has been sacrificed. It's magnified, treated with a fluorescent dye. And you see those little holes there? Those are actually areas where the capillary bed is breaking. So, and you can count the number of the leaks and the size of the leaks. And what she claimed was that if, if rats were exposed to noise, intermittent noise compared to actual quiet, they showed a dramatic increase. And she came to me and she said, Gary, she said, do you think we could actually see whether Reiki, because she was learning Reiki, whether you could use Reiki to reduce this effect and have an actual physiological effect on animals? And you can see the importance of this because it's a laboratory test. So we did the research. We had four groups of animals. The first was a no-noise control. We just wanted to see, I wanted to see what happened, again, if an animal for 20 days, um, what the, the magnitude of the effects were. And you can see that the number of leaks and the area leaks is that tiny little bar graph, very, very little effect. But with the, the second one, with the noise, where they have the speaker sitting over it, intermittent noise actually put in, after 20 days, look, you see the dramatic increase in that bar? You can see it's much higher in the number of leaks under that second column as well as the area of leaks. So now we have the two important conditions. Third group of animals, skilled Reiki practitioners came into the lab every day for 20 consecutive days and did Reiki in front of the cages. The fourth group with the dashed hands were people who did the sham. And the question is, what happened? And you can see, if you look at the noise plus the sham, that far right one, you'll see that there very little difference. It's a slight difference, but it's not statistically different. But when they get real Reiki, as opposed to sham, you see that decrease? And if you look at the area of leaks, it's almost as low as the no noise whatsoever. These rats are responding to genuine energy healing. Think about this. Of course, I couldn't believe it, so I wanted to see it replicated. So we did three experiments with the two primary important groups, the black, which is the noise plus the Reiki, and the white, which is the noise and the sham. On the left, we have the number of leaks. On the right, we have the area of the leaks. Three separate experiments notice in each case, the black is lower than the white. What's the take home message? Animals respond to real healing. And we can see this in the laboratory. It doesn't tell us how it operates but it tells us that it does operate. The, uh, I would love to share with you this in, in depth because it's fun, but we don't have time. Um, but let me just briefly share with you uh, the question about measuring light, since light is so fundamental and is so fundamental to spirituality. And um, in particular, the question of, how many of you have heard about the, the, the idea of auras? Raise your hands. How many of you have actually seen an aura? Oh, gee. Wow. OK, that's great. Um, the, um, not all healers see auras, only a subset do, and it varies. Typically against a white light background, they'll see light going over the top of the head or over the shoulders. If they're better, they'll claim to see light over the whole body. Some will be able to see even inside the body. Some people can do this from a distance. And the truth is, we have no idea if they're seeing anything. However, starting in Russia and then in Germany, with Fritz Popp, there was a discovery that all living cells emit light. It's called biophotons. And with a photomultiplier tube, you can actually measure individual photons if, they, if, the, if the cells are in pitch black, and then quantify the degree of light that occurs. I began to wonder, could we actually image this? Not just measure the moment-to-moment -moment changes, but actually see pictures of this using cameras that were originally designed to look into deep space. These super-cooled, low-light CCD cameras that are on the telescopes that allow us not only to see distant stars, but see distant galaxies that you and I can't see with the naked eye. What would happen if instead of pointing them out into deep space, they were to point at living systems? 
would we see that living systems, quote, glow in the dark? And then could we actually discover that they had auras? And were they actually communicating with their energy? Well, we initially had access to and ultimately eventually purchased one of these cameras. It's a long story and funny story. And we had the capacity to um, measure the, uh, the light emitted initially from plants. Part of the reason we use for plants, by the way, is that plants, of course, are uh, fundamental to life. And if you're going to have peace, we have to have peace toward everything. By the way, one of the things I love about plants, which I really hadn't thought about, is that as a group, they tend to be very peaceful. Have you noticed? <laughs> very low in violence. They're really very friendly beings of great service to, all, to each other and to the environment and so on. Anyway, we work with plants for a number of reasons. Number one is that unlike animals and humans, where you have all these appropriate protection, so we have human subject committees and animal subject committees and human consent forms and so on. There are currently no such committees for plants. Universe does, the university does, well, the universe does, but the university doesn't care if I, for example, cut a plant. I mean, we eat them. Consequently, I didn't have to ask permission from the university or the federal government to do this research, which made it much easier to do. Why? Because this camera that, we, that I'm showing you here, uh, in system, which I'll describe momentarily, we borrowed and we borrowed it, not, not meaning we couldn't take it out of the laboratory. It was in the Department of Radiology. So we had to use it like on Friday nights or on weekends. So I'd get a phone call from Kathy Kreth, who's an optical scientist, and she'd say, Gary, the camera's ready. Okay? And at that moment, I had to have subjects available. Well, what's great about plants is I go to the supermarket, buy some string beans. We got our subjects. Very inexpensive, <laughs> readily available. The third thing about plants is they don't mind sitting in the dark for long periods of time, and they sit still. So we can therefore get very long exposures in pitch black, which are necessary for the imaging. The camera's on the top. It's cooled to minus 100 degrees centigrade, which is very cold by this cryogenic tiger uh, uh, cooling system on the bottom. The lens is inside this light-type box. The staging is there for where you put the, 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 quote, subjects, the living systems on. You close the door, it's in pitch black. That's in a pitch black room and so on. This is a schematic. I'm going to jump right to an image that summarizes much of what we see. And when I explain this image, I think you're going to be surprised. Um, first of all, the, the first two images on the left are zucchini, slices of zucchini. The second two sets are obviously string beans. And the third are geranium leaves. Okay? Now, the reason why they look different, and I'll explain this in a second, is the ones on the, the right of each one are sitting on a black piece of paper. What does black do with light? It absorbs light. What does white do? It reflects light. If we want to see the tiny light that's surrounding the leaves, the plants, do we want to absorb it or reflect it back into the lens? We want to reflect it back to the lens. So you had, we had to manipulate whether it was on a black or a white surface. The color emerges because we use medical enhancement software to allow us to, allow us to see the patterns in the uh, in, the, in these images. Let's look at the first one here on the left, uh, the, with the, the black one with the, uh, with the zucchini. You see it, they're glowing. See that? You can see structure in them. They're literally glowing in the dark. They're emitting light. But there's no evidence of an aura. But look at the one on the right, on the left. You see all that, that white stuff? See that? And you see that it's more where the plant is than if there's no plant. You see that? And you notice how it's stronger when it's connected? And look at this over here. What does it look like it's doing? It looks like there's a matrix. It looks like they're reaching out and energetically grabbing each other. Think about this. Same thing with the string beans. You don't see the aura in the, in the, the, the dark. You see the clear structure. But in the light, with the white paper, it's brighter. You see when this, but they're near each other? You see all the yellow surrounding them? You, if you look closely, you'll see structure. You'll see patterns there. Geranium leaves, same thing. No aura on the white paper. There it is on the black paper. There's a structure of patterns. Healers, with their intention, can literally send intention to these plants and with intention increase or decrease the rate of illumination, the light that's emitted and therefore the auras around them. Well, you may be wondering, what about us? Do we, do we admit light? The answer is that we do. 
We're like an animal living system, just hard to squeeze us in the box. The camera. So if you're going to measure, for example, hands, you have to put somebody sitting in this very uncomfortable position, not moving, covered in black sheets to make it pitch black. And we were only able to get 10 minute exposures. The very first image were actually me taking pictures of Kathy Kreth's hands, my colleague. And you can see that this is with a little light in the box so you could see what it was looking like first. You'll notice when we're actually doing the 10 minute exposure, you see the glowing of the hands. It's black and white image, not converted to color. But you can see, sure enough, there's the image of the, of the patterns. Healers, when they're sending energy, you get an increased glowing and light emanating from the hands. Finally, probably most important for our global interconnection and peace is the notion that if all of our intention matters, this is what relates to group prayer, it relates to people coming together in harmony and ideally for positive effects, that if people have come together collectively and they have a shared positive intention and draw on this energy for the best and the highest good, can it be amplified? And can this occur over great distances? Lynn McTaggart wrote a book called The Intention Experiment. How many have heard of her book? I recommend it very highly to you if you're, if you're interested in the science about this particular kind of work. She has proposed that we do distant intentionality studies, and working with her, I propose that one of the simple experiments to do would be to see whether groups of people in a distance, like you, for example, if we were doing this, whether you could affect, for example, the growth of seeds hundreds of thousands of miles away. And we did six experiments, which I'm about to describe to you, and I'll, I'll give you the results, but I, uh, testing this hypothesis, which I presented at the Society for Scientific Exploration in Boulder, Colorado, a few minutes, uh, a few minutes ago. Do I, did, did you raise your hand? Not yet. Oh, I have time. That's good. I'm getting close to that. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to get a high five when we get five minutes. And the, um, okay, so here's how the experiment would work. My research assistant, Mark, would prepare four sets of 30 seeds, barley seeds, in our laboratory in Tucson. He'd put them in little hole, in little, you know, little plastic that holes in them. We'd then he'd photograph the seeds. He'd then Xerox, uh, he then email those four pictures to wherever Lynn was with a group. Let's say it's here. Let's say I was Lynn, we were doing the experiment. She would have these four images, and one of you in the audience would pick a letter from A to D. Somebody pick a letter. D? We got D. Uh, so she would then select D, the picture D, put it up on the screen, and then for 10 or 15 minutes, she would lead us through, a, uh, through an, an intention of sending love and the intention for this, these particular seeds to be more vital and grow more. After that was done, Mark would then plant the four sets of seeds. Now he was blind to which of the four were selected. But he prepares them for growth. They then water the same, fertilize the same, put in the identical conditions of non-light because they grow in the dark. At the end of five days, he then harvests the seeds, measures the length of each one, puts it into a cell spreadsheet, and then and only then do we break the code. Okay, you got the procedure? So there were 30 treated seeds and 90 control seeds per experiment over five days. And then in addition, I would have him run an additional uh, five days of four sets of seeds, but where there was no intention sent to any of the seeds to grow. You got the condition, you got the experiment? How did the results come out? Well, there they are. The ones on the left are the intention days. The, and we had six experiments, so the average of six experiments. The blue was the targeted seeds. In this case, it would be D, it could have been A. And then the other, the red, would be the, the, the mean of the other three, which would be the A plus B, D plus C. And you could see the, if they grew 5.5 approximately or 5.6 um, uh, centimeters compared to 4.5. That's a pretty dramatic difference. When they were in the intention days, so there's, that's the double blind, the purest result. And notice both of them are higher than the untreated seeds, implying what? That the other seeds were benefiting as well. Everybody was benefiting, but the targeted seeds were benefiting more. Turned out one of these six groups happened to be in South Carolina. It was an annual meeting of the Healing Touch International Association. 500 plus practitioners, skilled practitioners of energy healing. Five, okay. And what we found was that that group showed the biggest and purest effects. The biggest effects in terms of the 
the specificity and the least in terms of the, the, the effects on the, on the untreated seed. Implying what? That training matters in the targeting of energy. Now imagine if millions if not billions of people got together with a joint intention for peace and harmony and evolution. Imagine if we actually were guided to bring all of this together. What could be achieved? So let's get to implications and we'll end here. Is energy healing a natural and evolutionary human capacity? Well, listen, if we're in a physical body, if we're spiritual beings having a physical experience, and our, quote, minds can affect our brains and can affect our bodies, and since what we call a brain and a body is organized energy, to change our brain and our body is to what? Change our energy. Self-healing is self-energy healing. It's all energy healing. Most of us have a latent talent that we don't yet recognize as waiting to be received. So just as, although it's a different book and a different, uh, a different lecture, all of us have the potential to be antennas and receivers for a larger spiritual reality. All of us have the, the potential to receive this for the best and highest good for ourselves and others. And there's an emerging shift that's taking place in science from what you might call materialism, thinking of this as primary, to what you might call energyism in Einstein's quote. Now there's many promises of harnessing these unseen forces in energy medicine. Four of them include technology, Literally, companies are developing new technology of disturbances in energy and fields before physical disease becomes manifest. Literally, technologies that can see this ahead of time. Or alternative medicine, literally treating physical and mental disease in a generally and powerful way, avoiding the dangerous side effects of drugs and surgery. That sometimes happens. Or integrative medicine, combining the best of conventional and complementary and alternative medicine for the best and highest good. We can optimize the use of surgery and drugs. People are using energy healing and spiritual assisted healing both before surgery, during surgery, after surgery. People are having, getting energy healing to, to cope with the negative side effects of chemotherapy, drugs, so on and so forth. And finally, there's life enhancement, which includes promoting vitality, extending life, and fostering increased quality of living and loving. I would love to share the circle of heart energy and how we're all connected, but I, I, I think I should stay within the honor the time constraints. Do you think that that's appropriate? You want me to take two more minutes to do this? Okay, I really would like to do this. And because you said yes, I would like Vanessa to come up here. <laughs> We're going to demonstrate something. If you were to guess, and this is a hint from this slide, which organ in the body generates the largest electrical and magnetic fields in the body? What organ do you guess it is? Heart. That's very good. Okay. <laughs> turns out the heart generates electrical signals that are up to 100 times larger than the brain. It generates magnetic signals that could be up to 5,000 times bigger than the brain. We are liquids, 80 to 90% liquids. We've got all this salt. Our electrical signals, if we, put elect if we put EKG electrodes over Vanessa's heart, we'd pick up her EKG. But if we put them across her arms, we'd pick up her EKG. On the tips of her fingers, we'd pick up her EKG. The toes of her feet. This huge signal is going everywhere in the body, and therefore it's having an effect, a unifying effect, because it's in the center of the body. We heard living a heart-focused life that has a profound biophysical basis. Now, I want you to think about the following. What happens when we actually make contact, physical contact? Would you hold my left hand for a second? Notice, we're holding one set of hands. Now, would you hold the other hands? We're now holding two hands. What are we doing electrically when we... With electrical circuit. What happens with the electrical flow in a closed circuit? It flows. Your heart energy is flowing through your body, reaching your fingertips, right? You've got sweat gland activity in your fingers, as do mine. So where is your heart going? Where would you say? Where's your heart going? It's going into me. Yeah. Right, it's going into me. Where's my heart energy going? Into you. How do we prove it? Really simply. All we do is we open up our hands and we put an EKG machine between the two of them. If we do that now, my heart and your heart are both going to be what? Going through this EKG machine. Therefore, what are we seeing through the EKG machine? Two hearts. Thank you. So I want you to think about this. When we touch...
When, when we touch, we're literally connecting more strongly. Okay? How many of you in the first nine months of your physical existence spent that time in another living being? Raise your hands. Everybody. <laughs> we call those beings mothers. <laughs> Electromagnetically and biophysically, what the mother does, hopefully in a loving fashion, is she's generating this gigantic electromagnetic field that's going to, the, to the, what is going to become another human being in physical body. At some point, the fetus gets to the point where its heart starts beating. Where is its heart going? Back to the mother. It's all circulating in the, in the liquid. Mother goes to, ha to see whether or not her baby's heartbeat is okay. Person wants the physician is going to do a fetal cardiogram. Put electrodes on the mother's abdomen. What is that person going to see? Two heartbeats, which are what these signals are. Literally, the mother and the baby are connecting electromagnetically and energetically before the physical baby is born. The love, the peace, the inner peace that the mother has and affection, not just her, but the people around her, for her baby is a literally biophysically setting the stage for electromagnetic communion and beyond. And once we start realizing this, our whole vision of literally birth and the, the, the birthing process takes on a new light. There are maybe, I don't know, 200 people in this audience. If we created a, a huge circle, we were all holding hands, and let's make believe there were 200 people in this audience, how many heartbeats would be going through your chest when we all held hands? 200. Each of us would be literally, and we could record that. And what's really important is you don't have to touch to pick up somebody else's heartbeat. And in the book, I describe research that we did, as, which is also independently done by HeartMath, and they've done more studies than we have, showing that you can literally record the presence of one person's EKG in the EEG, or brain waves, of another person that they're simply just sitting across from each other, even though neither one of them is aware of it. And the extent to which the recipient picks up in his brain or her brain, the heart rhythm of the interviewer or the other person is related to their perception of love that they've had in their life. People who report that they experience their parents as loving and caring show a stronger and broader unconscious re representation of the loving hearts of others. So here's our poem, the end of our conversation here. I reach to forces unseen by Bill Worrell. He says, there are great powers and things we cannot see. Great spirit created many forces that mystifies people. We know the forces are there even though we cannot see them. There's a great force that holds us to the earth, but we cannot see it. We call that gravity. There's a great force that pulls objects together, that pushes them apart, but we cannot see it. We call that magnetism, for example. We cannot see the wind, yet it shapes mountains, moves the sands of the desert, lifts the clouds, bends the trees and the grasses of the prairies. We cannot see love, yet its force is undeniable. We do not see great spirit, though his works are all around us. By the way, if I had written this poem, I would have said her works, but that's another story. Surely it is not foolish to believe in powers and forces we cannot see. The birds walk on the wind, having faith to fly. How's that for a poem? The line, the birds walk on the wind, having faith to fly. So here's the question for all of us. For our own inner development, our own health, for the health of our loved ones, for the health of the, of the healthcare system, and for the help of the planet as a whole. The question is, do we have faith to fly? And you may say that it's kind of funny to hear a scientist talking about, do we have faith to fly? But in this case, we're talking about faith as in trust and faith as in courage. 
and faith as in commitment to manifest the potential that's there. And although I have some wonderful stories about ravens and the meaning of all the ravens for healing and so on, I think we should save that for another time. But I do wish to share with you that we are, that science is catching up to spirituality. And science, rather than taking spirituality away from us, rather than taking away spirit from us, is actually bringing us back to spirit in an even more wondrous and remarkable, if not magical and joyful way. And although our species and this planet is facing some of its most difficult challenges, we're also being given the opportunity to grow up. We're being given the opportunity to reach, to reach beyond where we have been. I heard this phrase, this, um, um, I can't remember who said it right now, but something to the effect was, when the worker is ready, the work will appear. Was that a great line? Not just when the, 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 uh, the student is ready, the teacher will come, but when the worker is ready, the work will come. We've got a lot of work to do, and it's coming, but I think we are becoming ready. And I see great inspiration for me personally, not raised in any of these traditions, to see what is the opportunity that awaits us. So I leave you with the last little phrase that I'd like to share, and that is, may the unseen forces be with you. <laughs> and we also have new meaning, by the way, to Canyon Ranch's phrase, who's helped support this research, the power of possibility. Thank you.